Go for it. I think everybody's here. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming today. I hope you enjoyed the time that we had. But we're very lucky to have Mark here. I'm lucky to be here. Enjoy your clinic today. But further ado, here's Mark Chuck. Thank you guys. Let's see if we get a nice golf club to put on here. There we go. So put your hand up if you love golf like I do. So you guys ready for the secret? You ready for the secret? Golf gives you exactly what you deserve. And sometimes it's not nice. Sometimes it is nice. Sometimes it's a lot of fun. But uh, I've been really lucky in this game, guys I, uh, and gals. And this is a q and I want you to ask me as many questions as you have, and I'll you know, give you my experiences on, on, in the game. The, um, like a lot of elements of golf, I grew up in Toronto. I'm a Canuck, transplanted Canadian. And it was interesting. One of my first experiences in golf could have went the wrong way. My dad took up the game when I was about six or seven years old. And in the garage was these funny looking things that weren't hockey sticks, as that's what I like to play. And I still do play men's league down in Chandler. And so I'm in the garage. I'm like, what are those things? I grab a couple of balls. I go to the schoolyard. And I saw a little on TV, right? So I hit a couple of things. And after about, they dribble, dribble, dribble. And I, kind of, I didn't realize how far they went. And maybe the, the proximity, I went back and looked. I thought I hit this thing really far. In actuality, it was like from here to the snack bar. Okay, literally like six squared. I hit this ball over a fence and broke a window. So that was my first experience. And the neighbor man that lived there was maybe a block away. And I'd seen him before, but he didn't know me really. And I didn't know him because it's just because he was a block away. But anyway, he's like, son. And I kind of panicked. So should I run? No, he kind of knows me. I can't get away. I'm not that fast. <laughs> Walks me home. And I don't know about you guys, but I didn't use my front door. I always used my side door. It was always the garage door, the kind of mud room, washer, washer, dryer room. That's where I went in and out. So my front door was like, Walk up a couple steps, I'm on my front door, this guy's beside me, rings the doorbell. Doorbell, you know, my father says, uh, what's going on? Guy says, your son hit a golf ball, went over the fence and broke my window. My dad went, really? <laughs> yeah, right? So that turned out to be pretty good. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I did, I did, dad, I hit a pretty good one. You know, so that was kind of my, that could have went the wrong way. I guess my dad had a nice round that day, right? So he took up golf. He took up golf, you know, kind of like probably you guys after maybe college. I'm going to guess maybe, who started golf as a kid? Okay, one golfer as a kid, two as a kid, three, okay. Yeah, so but most golf, when do you take, Gary, grab a seat, man, unless you're too anxious and you don't want to sit down. But Gary's a, probably the ball hitting this guy we have at the range here now. I see like three or 400 balls a day from this guy. VJ Singh, right? But so he, he learned golf like from his buddies. One guy took him out from work and said, hey, Chris, you know, come on on, let's play golf. And so it's interesting some of the things that he learned that I want to talk to you about today, okay? So just for fun, right? How about this one? Here's one here we're going to have a little fun with, okay? Watch my head and tell me if my head comes up. Did I lift my head that time? No. Okay. Went down, yeah. But you know what, man? I topped it. I must have peaked. I must have lifted up on that one, right? I might certainly lift it up. Let me keep my head down on this one a little bit longer. Oh, if it hops up just right, I can catch it. Darn it. But you can kind of see, you guys, we get sucked into golf. We get sucked into some of these things. How about, so, again, you guys could witness, you know, I've got a measure to the golf ball right now, and if I keep my, I can actually, I can actually get lower in topic, can't I? And I show that to the people in my school, like, that's the first thing we do at the golf school, is have a little fun with people, and try to talk about some of the misconceptions. How about, um, you know, I haven't hit any golf balls, but let me kind of hit a couple. I should get Gary up here kind of warming up and demoing. Guys, Gary, you're swinging it really nice, by the way. Way to go, bud. So what do you notice about a golfer getting ready to hit a shot? The club's, you know, I'm moving around. I'm not, I'm not static. You know, as I collect a golf ball and away it goes, right? The golf ball gets hit. I'm kind of, and I'm, I'll aim at some stuff for you. You guys can see that, you know, in a game of golf, I'm certainly not a, a robot of ball striking. I mean, I can hit it pretty good. I can still get it around the golf course pretty good. I'll be 50 this year. Um, no, I'm not going to try out for the Champions Tour because when I did play professional golf, those guys could beat me then, and they can still beat me now. And I have a little, couple little kids, and I teach all day. So I can still get it around pretty well, but you know, I don't have any uh, false hope of 
trying to go beat guys turning 50 this year that played for the last 30 years at a high level. But guys, what we see is, uh, I always hear back there, I always hear, man, I, I didn't stay down on that one. I always hear, you know, I, I got quick on that one. Right? Those are a couple goodies. Um, I didn't get through it. Okay, so are, would you agree that those are a few that you've heard I didn't get through it? So typically what happens when you don't get through a shot? Where, for a right-handed golfer, where's the ball go? If I didn't get through it, it goes to the right. Okay, now let me, let me tell you this. The, the instance of impact is one two thousandths of a second. That's pretty quick. Right? I can't see that. Some of the, my technology back there understands that, but I can't see that. So if the ball is going to the right, what you do after that moment of impact has nothing to do with getting through it. All right, so I'll say that again. Once the ball is going to the right, it wasn't about getting through it. It was about the preparation and organization of where the hands and club were leading up to the moment that gave you the opportunity to say you didn't get through it. Does that make sense, you guys, right? You know what my record is for the 100 meter dash? Anybody know? 87 meters. That's a joke. Come on, people. I've almost made it, right? If I could teach myself to be faster, I would. And there's some things you can do. Flexibility and hitting golf balls helps all that. If I could teach myself to be taller, I would. If I could teach myself to have a little thicker hair, I would. Okay, but what I can assure you is you can teach yourself how to strike a golf ball nicely. And that's kind of what I want to chit chat with you for this hour. And I, and I love questions. Hey, Martin, what about this? I heard that. What about this? Love that stuff, okay? I got a chance to one time, uh, my college roommate, he lived in Southern Ontario too. I grew up with a kid named Brennan Little and Mike Weir, who you've heard of, who won the Masters, and other kids that were pretty good. A couple played on tour, a kid named Ian Leggett was really good, a kid named David Moreland played on tour for a couple years. Ian Leggett actually won the Tucson Open one year. Uh, Mike Weir won the Masters and won eight times. Brennan Little was very good, okay? He, he didn't play the tour very long because his father was sick and he elected to kind of spend some time with his dad, and his dad actually got through the challenge. And, he, and Mike Weir said, hey, you know what? I know you're not really playing right now. Why don't you caddy for me for a couple months until I find a guy? And that, that turned out to be eight years, okay? But the cool thing about that was, on the way back into driving from New Mexico State, where I went to college, Toronto to New Mexico was like going to the moon, by the way, for four years, but I loved every minute of it. On the way home, he said, hey, we're gonna play with this guy named John Anderson, okay? And John Anderson was of the vintage of like high-level golf in the 40s. Like, that's how old this guy was. So at 88 years old, you guys, this is what it looked like. And it was amazing, okay? The guy shot 82 at 88 years old. Now he played the four tees, which would equate to the golds here, which at, 80, at 88 years old, you could play the 150s, you earned it, okay? So this was John, this was John. I should do it right to do it justice. Everything started back here and everything kind of walked in with a nice little waggle. He was feeling the weight of the club. Now naturally at 88, do you think he was really fast? I don't think so but it looks something like this. And that would have been a big miss for him. Now, how high did that go? Yeah, how far did it go? No, but you know what? It was out the middle of the face. Why do you guys play golf to shoot 64? I don't think so. Maybe some of you are highly competitive and it's all about score. I think part of my problem was it wasn't enough about score. You know what it was for me? I loved hit in the middle of the face. I love the squashing of a golf ball on the sweet spot, like a drug. Okay, not so much anymore. I guess I got over it. Gary is a drug, okay? <laughs> but for me, it was more about, man, I really loved hitting it nicely. I like putting a golf ball in place and the anticipation that's about to happen, right? Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And what are the three shots you can hit, guys? I just gave it to you, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, so every shot, like if I, I'm going to give you a couple of tricks that those people back there pay a lot of money for. And you're going to think, well, those aren't tricks at all. But if you can prepare yourself, feel the weight of the golf club, guys, walk in, and we're going to, I'm going to ask you some questions. Collect the golf ball. Okay, I don't know about you, but I felt good to me. You know what I mean? Thank you. Now, you know, I'm not Tiger Woods. I don't swing a driver 124. I swing it about 104. Okay, not bad. If I hit it well, it flies about 245. It goes about 275. Some days a little bit more, some days a little bit less. 
but you guys can learn to do some basic things. Okay, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you kind of the insights on what I see every single week. We do 30 of these golf schools a year, 23 or four of them here. Okay, and the other side, oh, actually a bit more than that. Some for Revolution Golf. If everybody, anybody watch Revolution Golf? Thank you for watching. Um, so we do Revolution Golf Schools, which are fun. They're, they're crazy. Sean Foley's a complete maniac, a lot of fun. Andrew Rice, a great guy. I mean, they're, they're great guys and they're all different. Martin Hall is lovely. You know, Jim McLean, he's like the grand master of the teaching business. I get to do a school with him in April, I can't wait. The guy is, he's, and he's a, he, this guy's 65 years old. He still swings at 108, 109. Can still shoot 60 something. If Jim McLean was a decent putter, Jim McLean would have been, because he is phenomenal of a swinger and a striker. Putter, that's why he, you know, he, was, he didn't quite stay on tour when he, when he had the chance, but he played in a couple of US Opens, a bunch of PGAs, the guy, guy's amazing. But here's what I want to share with you guys. And does anybody have a question? Let me just kind of understand it. Anybody have something you want to ask me? Nothing right now, okay, I'll go on my rant then. This is what I see every week. Okay, you know what really makes me mad? Cigarette butts out car windows. Okay, but on the golf course, this is what makes me mad. Interlocking grips that don't understand interlocking grips. And this is because your Uncle Al or Auntie Susan or Buddy Bob took you out to play golf and said, hey, you wanna play golf? This is what you gotta do. You gotta take that lead, that left hand of yours, and you gotta put those hands together. Put them right in there. Get that in there. And you're, de you're dead in the water right there. Not dead in the water, you shoot 89. That's what I did when I was Sure, well, Jack Nicholas. Have you ever met Jack Nicholas? Okay, sorry, I go on tangents. I almost peed on Jack Nicholas. 1986 U.S. Junior. I qualify for the U.S. Junior. I'm going down to Muirfield. Like, I'm so excited. It's unbelievable. I'm playing a practice round with Phil Mickelson. So I'm like, wow, this is cool. I hadn't played with Phil before, but we were both pretty high level juniors. I think Phil's done a little better than me in tournament golf, <laughs> as it would turn out, but that's okay. Anyway, so I've got to pee so bad, and I'm, and I'm like, let me go, Dad. Let me park the car in the front. I got to run in there. I'm going to pee in the car, kind of thing. So I get to the to the clubhouse at Muirfield, and the clubhouse is like a it's like a main story, and then you go down some stairs, and there's a back back area where the club where the golf shop is. And they've since redesigned it a bit, but it's basically similar. So I walk in, and it's the lobby, and it's a ladies' room, men's room. It's not the, it's not the locker rooms. It's just like a a two shooter for the men and, and a toilet, right? So I walk in. I'm standing there. And some guy walks in beside me, so there's that you know little little teeny divider, and, he, and he's like, "Hey, how you doing?" And it's Jack Nicholas, right? I'm like, "But trying not, I'm trying to maintain control myself here." He's like, "Son, let's finish our business. We'll wash our hands and introduce ourselves properly." That's what he said to me. You know what I mean? So it was like perfect, right? And he's like, "Cause he had, he'd won the Masters that year. He'd won the Masters that year. Then he just missed the cut, and I think it was the British Open where he got a bad draw and it blew like 82 miles an hour." Like, the, you know, he had an afternoon morning, and he, he said, yeah, he goes, he, in these fairways, the wind, was, it was crosswind going out and crosswind coming in. He goes, it would have been mad. He goes, I played pretty good to shoot 80 or whatever he shot to miss the cut. And, and, and the British, depending on the draw, it's a huge deal. You get the right draw where the wind's not blowing 40, and, you, you know, that's a big advantage, right? So that was kind of cool. But some of the things I want to share with you, I talked a little bit, guys, about the interlocking grip, Okay. And the interlocking grip's great, and it was because Nicholas said in his book, yeah, but have you seen Nicholas's hands? You know what I mean? They're itty-bitty little hands. They really, really are, okay? You know, and it's not a bad thing to interlock, guys. You know why interlocking, I'll tell you what the great thing about interlocking is. An interlocking grip, what do you notice about my index finger? It's not on the grip. Okay, so when an interlock, when an index finger is not on the grip, go ahead, everybody, and just take your fingers and thumbs and squeeze them together. When you squeeze them together, you lose mobility in your wrists, okay? The fingers, these three fingers, okay, that doesn't change mobility really, but when you squeeze, you basically freeze your wrists up, okay? So the interlock's great if you do it right, but an interlock grip, you guys, is only like this. It's not a big, it's not a webbing to webbing thing, so that's the misconception. You have an 85 or 90 shooting person taking a 120 shooting newbie out to the golf course, the 85 to 90 shooting person who's probably played a lot of golf, developed his own personal style, went like this. When you go too deep webbing to webbing, guys, guess what? You, most of you will lose control of where the club sits at the top. See where the club sits at the top right here? It's not sitting in my thumb, is it? It's sitting in something, uh, sitting in a seat like you're sitting in. Your arse is parked comfortably in a seat. That club is parked comfortably on a knuckle. That knuckle is like that seat, hopefully not going to go anywhere. 
right? So the weight of the golf club right now, you hold something two pounds in your hand, and you swing this thing, and guess what it does? It comes to rest on a peaceful place. No crazy blisters on this thumb, you know why? Because the thumb doesn't do anything. Now, no, like this, these are new grips actually, but even if I had my old set here, I could hand my grip over to you, and you look at it and go, yeah, they're just maybe a little oxidized or a little, you know, greasy or, you know, sunblock on them. I didn't wash them, but you wouldn't see any odd wear marks on them. Okay, if you see odd wear marks on your grips, you better hit a lot of balls to be really good. Because what we're looking for in a nice union of the hands, you guys, is certain place for this weight of the club to come to rest. Okay, so here's a place where it's going to kind of come to rest. It's going to come to rest against these last three fingers of your left hand. Okay, that's one of the places. The next place is it's going to come to rest is on that knuckle. Okay, I really don't want it coming too much pressure in a thumb or it's going to hurt after a while. And you're going to wear it all your gloves. Okay, so when you have good hands on there, a couple things I would always say to people, my club is gripping me, I'm not holding it. So right now if I take three fingers, and you've all seen this, right, so interlocking that doesn't do you much good, you're better off kind of taking your middle finger and, and feeling that cantilever of the club against the middle finger of the heel pad, right? So the weight of that club is putting pressure up in my hand. If I don't have my hand on properly, you know, the club's weight's going to cantilever and fall out of there, okay? so. And then a right hand, guys, or a trail hand for any, any lefties in here? No lefties? Okay, so I'm talking to right-handers. Good, I can talk right-handed, left-handed. So a right hand, when I put my, a, a nice right-hand grip, see my left thumb? Okay, now you don't, or you don't see much of it anymore. Because this is another big, big piece of what we kind of teach people back there. We see a lot of people coming into impact, guys, where kind of hands are separated, hands are coming off the grip. You look at slow-mo of the best, slow-mo video of the best players, you're going to see a look that looks something like this as we come into impact. You're going to see the palm of a right hand nicely on top of a left thumb. You're going to see something else I'm going to give you for your Arcus membership, some of these little secrets, right? You're going to see how a trail arm isn't straight yet. How a trail arm is in the act of straightening. We collect the golf ball with the trail arm still bent. It's on its way to being straight, but where is it straight? It's straight after the ball is gone. And then what, what ha what's important about the next piece? Nothing. Style. Okay, so what happens about here is all about how we slow down with style. The ball is gone. So when you watch a fairly stylish swing, and my coach made me do this all the time, you know, so if I hit a little seven iron out there, you know, again, we'll talk about this routine bit, and I'll, I'm going to lose track. So if I, if I, something interests you, and just say, hey, Martin, just stop me, okay? So every practice swings behind the ball, you guys. Every shot starts on the target line with a whew, little cleansing breath. I'm doing it loud so you can hear it, okay? And as I walk in, I'm always in motion, you guys. Club's off the ground. There's a little waggle. What do you notice about my heels? Everything's kind of moving. Then there's a sense of pause and calm. And then I'm going to collect the ball, collecting the ball. And now I can, you know, do my club spin and I can watch the shot and go, okay, nice little strike, almost really solid, good enough, okay. Functional, right? It wasn't perfect, just a functional little shot. Because if I play a lot of, in, I call it indifference, like that may be a great shot for a newbie, right? For me, that was just a little bit skinny, okay. so. Good, bad, or indifferent. As long as I had a lot of indifference in my round of golf, that's usually a good score. A couple good ones really feel crushed out the sweet spot. Not because I swung harder, just because maybe the contact was more centered than the fractionally thin one there. Okay. I got a question. Please. Uh, position of your uh, grip. Yeah. Pointing to your belt buckle, pointing to your seam of your band. Sure. Okay. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm recording this, you guys, so that I'll, I'll put this on YouTube and you can watch it another time, right? So I'm going to repeat. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll repeat the question so you can hear it later. Position your grip relative to the body. Is it going to be something, a forward hand location or a mid body hand location, right? That's your question? So, you know, just so you guys can see it from your perspective a little clearly, if I use my aiming device here, which I, I'm a fan of using aiming devices, but in a, there's an address hand location, you guys in an impact hand location. Okay, to me, impact's dynamic. What's your name, partner? Ken. Ken. So at impact, I'm in the act of unwinding 
Okay, I can't stand here for very long. This is athletic. This is something that is, I'm in the act of unwinding to smash a golf ball here. Are you with me? Yep. So I can't start there in my opinion. I start in a mid-body hand location knowing that I'm going there. Okay. okay. Think about this, you guys. The club weighs two pounds, right? Does the club really want to go on, on a backswing? Or, no, we got to use, we got to use our horsepower to move two pounds. We've got to get it going, don't we? So watch, watch what happens if you're really relaxed. And that's why if you take one piece away from this clinic, this little half practice swing back here, okay? This little half, watch this club. Am I taking a divot in my little practice swing? Is that a, did I take a big divot? No, of course not, because Eddie'd get mad at me, right? I didn't take a big divot. Now, but that little feeling, you guys, is, is I'm putting in, I'm programming what I need for the shot. Do I need to fade it a little bit? Okay, if I need to fade it a little bit, then I know the club has to travel a little, you know, across the target line and part a little fade spin. And we'll talk about curves if you want. If I need to draw it a little bit, I, need, I know the club has to travel a little down and out to touch the ball. Okay, I also know that, you know, at 50, and you guys are of my age and older, okay, and by and large, right? You know, is my shirt pulling on me funny? Is my shirt stuck here on my shoulder? Do I, I want to make this little motion to feel, yeah, okay, I feel nice. I'm ready to walk in, waggle, feel the ground with my feet, inspire motion. So Ken, come on up here for a second. Here, hit this seven iron for us, I'm kidding. But stand here, let me show you something cool. Set up to Whitey, okay? Get ready to go. Awesome. <laughs> well, you're not going to actually hit it. This yeah. is, I'm going to ask you a question. Just, this is just for the group, okay? Great. So lovely. So way to go. So I appreciate a guy who's taught himself how to put his hands on nicely. So way to go, Ken. Okay. So now, no, no, you hold on to the club. Okay. okay. So you ready to go? Yep. Okay, cool. Now, do me a favor, make a backswing. Okay, can't. make a backswing. Can't. Your foot's there. Come on, baby. Yes, you can. Now, you do me a favor. Come here. Well. <laughs> you, you, you trade positions with me. Okay. Okay. So again, now you put your foot where I put it, right there. You got insurance, Ken? Yep. Good. Gonna need it. Okay. So watch, guys. So this club's in my hand. I've got the weight of the club in my hands. Okay, watch, watch what happens. This is one of those annoying things in a neighborhood that say, when the 20 mile an hour sign, that's a mere speed bump if you're not taking it back with your hands. Right now, mm -hmm. feel this, and you guys can't feel this because you're not can, okay? But if I take it back with my hands, you feel that? Yep. I can't move the golf club because your foot's in the way because right. this is the source of motion, okay? Right. If the source of motion is more inward, internal, yeah. Okay. In my hands, what have I been preaching? A little waggle, guys. Don't you all kind of want to feel loosey-goosey and relaxed? You know you do, right? But how do you do it? You do this. You set the club here, and then you go, dee dee dee. Milk it, milk it, milk it, grab it. Oh, can't go anywhere. How about a little different? How about get the club in your hands? Feel the weight of the club head in your hands. Right now as I go, guess what? That's just a mere little boop boop, a little speed bump. Because, thank you, buddy. Good job. Yeah, thanks. You're a great speed bump, Ken. So, <laughs> my point is, there's the weight of the club at the end of a stick, right? So if I'm really, if I'm waggling and I walk in and I'm relaxed, if the inside moves, this doesn't really want to move, does it? Watch what happens, guys. See how that's almost like a lagging? The club has the last thing to go. Now, if you watch really slow-mo, like a modern-day Hogan, is a Jason Duffner. Okay, Jason Duffner's kind of got that look. Okay, now, it's all out of the water. DJ definitely picks it up and manually uses his hands. So there's a lot of ways of doing it. I just have my preferences for the people I coach. And a lot of people say, Martin, do you teach tour players? And I go, yeah, I teach some. I really don't want to teach tour players. You know why I don't want to teach tour players? Because i got a great thing just teaching who I teach here, which is you guys. And I get to go home every night. I don't have to travel with some prima donna every week and just hope he plays, makes the cut. Right? I know I, you're not make, trying to make a cut. You're just trying to shoot 82 and have a nice day playing golf. That's why I like to teach. i got a coach that teaches tour players back there. He's great. Let him do that. He doesn't have any kids. You know, he can travel more than I can. i got to be at home. But my point is, you guys, you see how this relates? Now think about this. The club's in the air for a moment. You saw me hit a couple of shots. At no time did I rest the weight of the golf club on the ball. I mean, on the ground. At no time. The club is always a part of me. The club, the weight of the club is always being kind of 
an awareness is put into my body by this little move. If you can get something out of this little clinic, it's this, right? And as the inside moves, the club head really doesn't want to move. And then when I go the other way, when I unwind to hit it, does the club head want to go this way? Not really. Because what happens? The opposite happens. It wants to keep going that way. And so that's called what? What's the magic word everybody desires? Lag. Okay, I can tell you, I never tell anybody to hold an angle. I never tell anybody to try to, you know, stick that elbow in there. Hold the angle, okay? And for those of you that feel you're too quick, I assure you, two minutes on track, man, measuring your club head speed, there's probably nobody too quick in this group. Jim Waldron back there swings at 145 miles an hour as a world long drive competitor. He may qualify as being too quick, okay? I'm not too quick. Now, what is too quick, really? What do you think it is? How about a difference in transition that's kind of not pleasing? The difference between your backswing to downswing, right? So think about it. If I swing a driver, say, 100 miles an hour, okay, and I go like this, and then I try to go to 100 miles an hour, that transition's quick. If I swing a driver 100 miles an hour and it does something more like this, That's not that quick, is it? Because one thing was in a better response to the other. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay. And did I answer your question about hands? Cool. So if I took you back in time, has anybody heard of George Knudsen? Canadian guy, one on tour, you've heard of him? Awesome. Any Canadians in the group? Awesome, awesome. Go Leafs, go. <laughs> Matthews came back. Yeah, so. Newton, guys, we did something like this. The reason I use a T-square with pretty much every student back there is homage to my mentor, okay, Mo Norman George Newton. But Mo didn't use aim sticks, but George did with all his students. But the reason we did this, guys, is because we looked at, he liked to look at things like a quadrant, like quadrants. So there's four of them here. We stand in two of them, okay. The club really lands where? Where are these divots So those shots I hit with a seven iron? They're at and after the ball, aren't they? Right, where was my low point? Where was the bottom of my swing? That pink piece of tape there is the bottom of my swing. Was it the golf ball? No, it's a little after the golf ball, isn't it? I'm not really trying precisely to hit that. Okay, one of my, so I'll use uh, this as an example. Here's my golf swing, guys. Right here. There it is, but let's make it more like a golf swing. There's a bit of an incline golf swing. I could have it, I could have it back here. I could have it way too far forward. Good players have that problem usually. Here's your bad player, per typically. Here's your good player suffering. Too much of that. Where's that low point? If I take my hula hoop bottom, guys, and I want it to be ideal, you know, at and after the ball, right? At and after. The good player problem is typically too much of that. Where's that throw the low point? Back here, too inside out, pushy hooky. Okay, that's when I get going bad, I get too much of this. The newbie has too much of this. Way too down, way too steep. You know, deep, deep divots until they teach themselves to do what? Back. what you know what I mean? What do they teach themselves to do? What's a newbie? This steep newbie goes like this. Steep, oh shit. So here's what, ha this is amazing. So watch. Ready, catch. Catch. So how hard was that for you to figure out? You didn't have much time there. If we, t we timed that, you were like, oh, shit, that wasn't coming at me. I could just casually go like this. Mind you, it is kind of coming at my tender spots here, but I'll be, I can catch that thing pretty casually, right? Now, if I'd have thrown that faster, you might have caught it or I might have hurt somebody in the back row. Yeah, you would have caught it. But see, the, your instinct's amazing. And it only takes a couple of swings for instinct to creep in on a, gol in a, to, on a golfer, right? So here's, the, here's what happens with a, I topped those golf balls for you on purpose earlier. You know why? I didn't want to disappoint my dad. I didn't want to disappoint Uncle Al. No matter what, I'm joking. But no matter what I'm doing, if my dad said, hey, son, keep your head down, the best thing he ever did for me was, you know, encourage me to love the game and then took me for some lessons, right? I had, I had an opportunity to get some high-level lessons from a guy, who George Newton, of all people, right? I was so lucky, right? And so George said to me, and imagine like Clint Eastwood. So this is how cool this guy was. He had a stash. He was a good dresser. He kind of looked just squinty. He'd rub his mustache. He'd say, Father teach you to keep your head down, didn't he? I'm like, yes, Mr. Nitsen. Yeah, we're going to fix that. 
like, whoa, right? Rock my world because it isn't the magic elixir of all good golf to keep your head down. Well, now you're kind of questioning that, right? Because that rocked, my, it rocked me that day. So the bottom line was he's like, son, nobody's going to come take the golf ball away from you. He goes, when you look at it, you're going to swing, you're going to collect, you're going to hit the ball and just watch it go. He goes, you want to feel like the weight of the golf, you want to swing the weight of the golf club, son. And you'll feel a lot better if you can kind of track the golf ball. He goes, honestly, he goes, I pick it up not too far off the club face. So as soon as one of the best ever ball strikers regarded by his peers said that, I'm like, oh, okay. And so imagine my father, you know, 85 shooting, played three times a week, right? I, I play once a month now, 18 holes if I'm lucky. I played three, four holes pretty much every day though with students. Said, you know, if the best player Canada has ever known told me it's okay to kind of watch the golf ball, guess what I did? Started watching the golf ball, right? I wish George would have lived. He passed away in uh, 88 or 89, sorry. Passed away in 89. I wish he would have lived to enjoy Annika and her run of 79 wins, right? To see this Swedish gal who came over and played a U of A, who had this kind of swing, by the way, Right? And then her coach in Europe taught her how to do this. And all of a sudden she went on a tear and won the U.S. Open at 21 and then won 70 and a shot at 59 at Moon Valley here in the Valley, right? Because he would have loved that swing probably the most. The freedom of swinging the club head, she swung the weight of the club head probably better than anybody. And, you know, I met her. I met her one time. It's kind of funny. I have a dog named Annika. You know why it's named Annika? Because of Annika Sorenstam. I had a Seve Ballesteros. I had an Arnold Palmer. Now I have an Annika. Now we adopted a dog who had a name already, Boo. So not to confuse, and it's not Boo Weekly, we just, not to confuse the dog, we kept its name Boo, or I would have named it something else. But there's a gal who started to, a drill, okay? So she was, she had that, and she did it with a wedge. Her coach is a guy named Henry Rice, or Reese, I forget, I don't know how you pronounce it, and he's from a European country, he's got a, such an accent, I couldn't tell, it's like he's, he's got marbles in his mouth. So he taught Annika to go ahead and follow every bit of the flight of the golf ball and hitting these wedge shots. You know, so she'd collect the ball, nice crisp little strike, and every little bit of it, transport the club, rotate and relocate, the language we talk about in the golf school on, you know, how these quadrants relate. So if you're my target, guys, and I stand in here, and this is how George started us kids, is we held the club peacefully on our thighs like this, okay? And we just simply learned how to do that. How to rotate our body into, kind of into our left heel. I'm wiggling my left toe, okay, in my very comfortable Nike shoes. Gotta give them a plug because they were super nice to me, okay? But I'm rotating and relocating into my left heel up on my right toe. So this is how we started. So do you think we did this for five minutes? How about 10 minutes? How about three hours one day? How about three hours the following day? How about three hours the third day? And how about three hours the fourth day? We did this. Do you think he was trying to make a point, you guys? Right? So he had a hand-selected group of juniors that he picked, a junior development program. And so imagine Clint Eastwood. Do you think he would take any crap from a, you know, I was probably a spoiled little kid, gotta be honest. You know, you play golf when you're a little kid. You know, you have, the, you, know, you have that opportunity. You know, I was probably one of those pain in the ass kids. But so I was tell you what, whatever George said I was gonna do, all, all, and I'm, I was a pretty good kid, mind you, but spoiled. But he, if he said do that, I was gonna do that. I had a respect for the coach that I knew could go paint the sky with golf balls where he wanted them to go, okay? So we did that. So and then, guess, we didn't even hit a golf ball. So the Friday comes along, guess what? We get to hit a golf ball. And all of us were golfers already, except one kid. Okay, one kid, he, he brought this kid into the program, didn't even know what end to hold. And that was his little project. The kid became a very good player, qualified for the U.S. Amateur one year, is a very good teacher on the, at a resort, uh, Bear Mountain on Victoria Island. Very, very good player and teacher. So you think we learned how to do this, right? Rotation, relocation. Okay, so I've taken rotation and relocation, and I've added two more R's to it. Reflection, okay? and then possibly refinement. Meaning that you have a moment every time you make a swing, guys, to, to uh, you know, what'd you do? Did you hit a bad shot? Fine. 
Did you hit a bad shot and then go right away and rake up another ball? Or did you hit a shot, right? And then in a moment, did you take the learning possibility there, just the possibility and go, okay, yeah, maybe I wasn't as organized as I needed to be in my backswing. Uh, the transition wasn't as smooth as it could have been. You know, maybe I felt like I did hang back. Right, can you be a good coach to yourself or do you immediately just go, ah, and rake up another ball in disgust? Most people do what? The latter, right? And how good are golfers really? You know, some get really good, most don't. Okay, most, it's, it's, they don't give themselves a moment of reflection and a moment of refinement in order to really go to the next level. So I've, I've taken on this new, new thing we call it back there, cellophane. So what's cellophane? Keep your sandwich from spoiling if you only eat half your sandwich, right? Put it over the soup, keep the bugs out, whatever you want. It's, you can take your finger and you can poke it through cellophane pretty easy, can't you? Right? So how about what you saw me do in this little pre-shot routine? What I did in the pre-shot routine, so you guys don't realize, but you know, I got to work on stuff too, right? I'm always working on my feels that I need to project that golf ball with some reliability to a target, okay? So here's a piece of cellophane. Let me, let me explain. The club's on the ground only for, for as long as it takes me to get my hands on it, and then it's never on the ground again, okay? This isn't on the ground, guys. It's really close to the ground, but it's not on the ground, okay? This is me feeling the club swinging around me. Now, what did I do there? You just look at it like a little practice swing, right? But I look at it like, no, 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 no. I was feeling how my arms were in my back swing. Was I managing my arms, you know? Or did I maybe do it a little differently? Maybe I did something like this. Did I do that? Because that's what I get to teach all the time, okay? So you saw something a little more structured, a little bit more organized, something pretty peaceful that is maybe, maybe, I don't know, half, two-thirds the speed I'm about to put on the ball. And then how about a one little cleansing breath, right? Now, I don't know if I'm going to hit a good shot or bad shot. I, might, I, I think I'm going to hit a good shot. May not, and I'm okay with that. Hey, a bad shot. Okay. And so I can go and reflect now and go, okay, what did I feel there? Right? Or I can get all steaming mad and go, oh, rake another ball over. And to be honest, what was the difference? Can you all tell? What was the difference, guys? There wasn't one. I missed. Is it safe to say you miss? Basketball. Boom, boom, boom. Whew. Right? You miss. Oh, shit. Okay, I get another chance. Another ball. Hey, I made that one, right? You always have to look really closely at your mechanics every time you miss hit a shot. A lot of people do. Do you really need to? No. Guess what? Golf's hard. This thing's three inches. There's about an inch worth that's valuable, but they charge you for all three inches, right? You could sell the part in the middle as new sometimes, right? Okay, we miss. That's okay. You know, if we didn't miss, we wouldn't play golf because it'd be boring because we'd all be amazing. But if we miss, guess what we need? Other skills. That ball would have missed the green. We didn't short right. Guess what skill you need if you miss the green? Can you hit an effective little pitch shot from here to there? Right? Can you make a, can you answer the question the golf course asks you? You know, maybe that's green sloping away from you. Maybe the green's into you. Maybe it's right to left, left to right. Maybe there's some wind. Maybe you got a bare lie. Maybe you got a little rough. You know, maybe it's down when the ball's going to release. Maybe it's into the wind. The ball's going to check. Okay? Can you play golf like that? That's what's fun about golf. And you're like, Martin, I'm all over the damn place. I have too much fun at golf. I want to be a bit more boring. Right? But some of it, like, if you can contain some of the frustrations of wild misses to where you get the middle of the face, can be rather fun, can't it? Right? Okay. So with George, we did a lot of this. A lot of this. And I always joke with the golf school folks back there, I say, guys, and this, this would be the audience, you're looking at it, this, this age you're perfect, right? Some younger guys, some older guys, whatever. I say, guys, I want you to be freshmen in high school, and I'm your grumpy old coach in bad, bad bike gym shorts. You know those polyester bad shorts? Awful. I still have nightmares about those shorts. One guy shouldn't have been wearing those. Anyway, I'd say, 
If you're 14 and you want to make my high school golf team, we have the state champ. We have the state champ. We're state champs every year. I got three seniors coming back and two juniors, and the juniors can pretty much beat the seniors. You're not going to make it as a freshman. I can tell you right now. You it might be a freak, but but you're probably not going to make it. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a plan on how you might crack the lineup by the time you you are a junior. Right, and it's not swinging for the hills. It's not, you know. I love Arnold Palmer. I've got to meet him about a half dozen times. He couldn't have been nicer to me. But swing your swing. If your swing sucks, don't swing your swing. Get a better swing. Swing a better swing, because your swing may make you unhappy. Sorry, Arnie. You know, yeah. I mean, I want you want you to have license and latitude within your physiology to move the club which works for you. But you got to have a few laws down. You know, what are the good laws of impact, guys? Tell me. You rattle them off. Just give me one. Come on now. What's the law of impact? <laughs> yeah, the face. How about the middle of the face? Yeah, how about the little ball before the big ball? Right? Those are good. How about anything regarding path? Think about it. What's that? Inside out here. Sure, sure. So, you know, inside out's a good one, right? I love inside out. So let's talk about that. Inside out. I'm going to use a prop, okay? And Kev, I may need a little hand. You got a tea or two, buddy? I got one. And Kev, you're going to be, put your hands together for Kevin, my assistant. Only thing, I need you to tee up like three balls. So just kind of stand there for me, if you don't mind. And since I'm going to be over here, I'm going to talk about inside out path, okay? But it'll be way better if you see it from here. And I fell in hockey the other night, so this right knee of mine's a little, little tender. So. Would it make any sense for me, so if I hit this ball down there, and I probably hit it straight off my knees and off my two feet, but let me hit one for you. As I, as I proceed to hook one. It's right about there, buddy. Awesome. Good, nice and high. Perfecto. That's pretty straight, isn't it? Okay, perfect. Hitting, oh, you're right, the towel. You're right. That's right. What year in tournament was that for bonus points? All right, so let me ask you. So what part of this club is traveling straight back and straight through from here? None of it. None of it. How'd the ball, they go pretty straight? Yeah. Do me a favor, Kev. Put one back there for me, bud. Okay, now how about if I took myself, I keep my alignment the same. I put the ball over here. Where's the ball going to go? How about more to the right? Yeah. Why? I hit it in a different part of my circle, didn't I? What's so funny, dude? You know, and how about if I did the same thing, right? And I move myself over here. Now where's it going to go? It's going to go more to the left. So that's why we take great care in ball location. Right? Or we could be spastic about it and try to be straight back and straight through. Does that paint a different picture now for the circle of a golf swing? I'm honestly straight, like I, if I, if you said to me, you know, Martin, you got to hit driver in every hole on this golf course and the fairways are tight. I'd say, okay, I'll take your bet all day long. You know how I do it? Like this. You know, I'm serious. So you're giggling and let me, let me give you a, a funny story. So Doug York, okay, we got a guy who comes eats lunch here all the time. He's, him and his brother and dad started Ewing Irrigation. Okay, they sell landscape supply stuff to the nation. Company does really well. It's like a $700 million company. So he's been out to like two, three golf schools. Great guy, over the years, right? It's my, it's my seventh year here. And so Doug says to me, hey, could I like buy the whole golf school and just send my, and send my salesman to it? Because they need to learn how to play golf. I'm like, yeah, we can work that out. Yeah, sure. So like the first week in January, he buys the, the golf school. So the people he sends to the golf school, they're not online people. They're no, they don't know who Martin Chuck is. They, don't, they haven't watched Revolution Golf. These are 35, 40-year-old guys. They, they're salesmen. They sell, they sell supply stuff to these farmers and landscape guys and golf course superintendents. Right? So it wouldn't matter what teacher taught them. It didn't matter. They showed up. And typically when I come up to do a golf school, they follow me online a little bit. You know, they always say, hey, Martin, I watch your videos. I feel like I know you. Well, great. It's a, oh, thanks for coming. So they kind of know who I am when they sign up to come out, right? Well, these guys didn't. And these guys, to a guy, okay, strong guys, drove F-150s, arm tats, OK? 
okay? Work hard Monday to Friday. Weekends, crack about 24 of these. Sell more supplies, right? That's a, that's a fairly normal guy, okay? Now, what do you think they tried to do with a ball and a tee? How about some of this, boys? No, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to get that thing, boy. We're going to get that thing. Oh, yeah. Oh man, lots of speed there, no application of force, right? <laughs> lots of that stuff, right? So I'm thinking to myself, huh, because I've done the knee. We have some extra drivers back there that are beat to smithereens because of this drill. So every one of those guys, you know what we did? On a towel, on their knees, with the driver out here. Why? Because then they started to realize that golf has a couple pieces. It has this circular event. And within that circular event, what's this club face do? It's got a rotational event. So not only is this club traveling on a circle, right? So watch this a little closer. Kev, give me one more right about there, brother. Kevin Weber, PGA, right PGA, there. PGA T setter. That's all right. So this is a, watch now guys, you'll see it a little differently. Isn't this both circular? and a little rotational, right? So I don't know where the face is aiming, but again, it goes way straighter than when I'm on my two feet, and I'll explain why in a sec. You know, do I feel it? I would say, to, that's a great question. You know why I would say no? Because do you think Elton John or Billy Joel or when he's looking in the crowd, smiling, singing Piano Man, do you really think he's thinking of what his fingers are doing? Think about it. So the communication guys, how are you doing on time, Kev? Just curious. Sorry. Awesome. I could do this all day, by the way. I love this stuff, okay? Um, to your point, when you become, people come to the golf school, what do they say? They go, man, Martin, I'm thinking of a lot. I've got a lot in my brain, right? I've got a lot going on. Go, Good, we got you right where we want you. Okay, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of conscious thought anytime you learn something new, guys. Let's face it, you know, how to get away from the bad interlock grip, how to get your hands in a place you support the weight of the club better. Conscious, 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 and then it's not, right? How a club is basically this circular event. And how about the bag there? We've got this circular event, and we have this circular event, and we have this, which one's this? Putter? Yeah, putter. Which one's down here? Driver, mish, right? And then you have 14 circular events. Now the putter doesn't look circular because why? It's just this teeny weeny little thing, right? It doesn't look circular, but it is. I don't want you to think about it as circular. You can think straight back, straight through as a putt. But a driver's cir sure circular. Now, I don't, uh, the same thing, guess what? It's not that circle. I didn't take it back like, you know, it's not this, is it? It's an incline relative to a golf club. So it's got elements of, you know, my coach used to say back up and in. Instantly and simultaneously. So how about back, up, and in. All together, not too much of this and then this, right? Not too much of this and then this. My I'd rather have that one than this one. I see that one all the time. Because everybody wants to hit a draw, right? They're tired of slicing it, so what do they do? Oh boy, they're gonna swing it inside out. Where's my, where's my low point go, guys, if I'm gonna swing inside out? Way behind the golf ball. I would challenge you to th use a different word, okay? And freak out your friends and your force them next time. If you hit a slice, you say to them, look them straight in the eye and say, I didn't quite get that club to orbit inside out. They look at you like, okay? But think about this, if I held this club right now in my index finger and thumb pretty powerlessly and I start to spin, what's it doing? Can I, you know, think about it. And by the way, on my knees, you think I could go over the top? Can I, if, if I'm reached out here on my knees in a driver, can I really get on the other side of the ball? I can't, can I? No. In baseball, have you ever seen anybody get over the top? The guy you don't pick the next time you have sandlot ball, right? Okay, you can't get over the top. In golf, you can, why? Because in golf, some interesting things happen. You know, we get our visual of this target line. We lose perspective really about what the swing's job is, circular and rotational. We get this new perspective of, okay, and then we try to hit it like Tiger Woods with the physiology, sorry guys, 
you go dunk. Who can dunk a basketball still in this group? Anybody? You're tall, maybe you. I don't know. Anybody? I can't either. Okay. Yeah. So now, rather than be John Anderson, the 88-year guy, shed 82, guess what? Well, I think, you know, maybe if the planets line, I might just hit this one 350. I might just, and I just might be six foot and have way more hair. Not happening. Okay? So rather than understand what our kind of physical abilities are, what do we do? We take on a lot of unnecessarily unreliable rubbish. So as I kind of go into a shot here and I settle in, pressure, 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 feeling the weight of the golf club. If you stop me at the top of my swing, boom, I'm done. That's it. Here's my backswing. There's my backswing. Let me show you my backswing again. Let me show it to you again. Where are my arms? In front of my chest, aren't they? Right? What? Do me a favor. I should, I kind of messed this up. Because I was in a PGA seminar and like, when I was 20 something. And this great teacher from Australia, a guy named Peter Croker, he said, all right, mate, show me what the right arm does in the backswing. Like 25 pros, 30 pros sit in the audience like you guys. And every pro about smacked the person to the right. They did this. And he said, oh, fellas. Question? Oh, no. Oh, that's just scratching your head? Okay. So my point is, here's a backswing, guys. There's a backswing. Okay, now if I turn my back, looks like golf, doesn't it? At any part of that backswing, did I pull this right arm behind me and create a bunch of funky angles that are going to be hard to get out. Hard to get out. How long is the swing? 1.3 seconds? Yeah. And, and most of it's going back, right? And a, and a little piece of it's going down. So if you create a bunch of funky stuff, going back, getting it all out, good luck to you. What's everybody say when they come to my golf school? What do they want? What do they want? Yeah, they want consistency. Oh, but don't take away my speed. In fact, I want to hit it farther and down the middle every time, by the way. I'm like, yeah, me too. Get on your knees, I say, right? So you guys, you know, learning how to be, how to get the center of the face to hit sweet shots. Because I assure you, if you played golf and you hit it on the button and it kind of went straight-ish, ish is all we're looking for, by the way, not perfect, ishes are good in golf. Okay, and I'll tell you my ish story with Jason Day. And you hit it sort of solid all day, you feel like this at the end of the day. I am Captain America, or Captain Canada, because that feels really good. If you've laid the sod over it, hit it thin all day, had too much face-to-path deviation, you're like, walking in your car miserable. Not miserable, you get over it and you live for another day of golf, right? So I would tell you guys, if we can kind of get out some of the compensations, and this is where actually the word swinging easy actually applies because it's all a sequence, you guys. It's all a sequence. Now, if I said, yeah, come on up here, big guy. Come on over here for a sec. And I haven't, wait, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Bill. Bill. Martin. All right. So you stand here for a sec. Now you put your hand on my hand gently because you're a big guy. Okay. Now you feel, I'm going to get this thing tick tocking and feel how I accelerate it. I'm not twisting it, I assure you. Feel how the club is going down and I'm moving your hand up. And there's a timing there where the club's down and I'm going the other way, right? Mm -hmm. So one's going one way, I'm going the other. Thank you, bud. You felt that? Yep. So this is a big little takeaway from this, you guys. When a club's going one way, I'm going the other. What gets this angle to come out? An opposing force. Why do golfers generally not play that well? Because they've been taught to do what? Stay down. Okay, there's the weight. If I'm gonna wallop you with this inflatable ball that people love, thankfully, because my wife's and my kids are expensive, to get this thing moving, I have an equal and opposing force to move it. I can get it moving fast and wallop you in the chest with it. To get it to wallop, I have to go the other way. I have to go opposing to what I'm hitting. Now in golf, guess what the newbie does? There's ball, kill chicken, right? that kind of thing. The more developed golfer, whether they do it because they're taught or by accident, they're like, hey, way to the golf club. Doesn't that look more like what a really good player looks like? How about Rory McIlroy's follow through? Does he look like this? Or does he look like this? 
Did he start like this? Or did he start like this? He started like this, didn't he? He started in what we call a forward bend. And when he finishes like this. So there's an event going on. And golf is bloody hard, guys. Sorry. But it's fun. It's more fun than checkers. They don't build resorts by the ocean for checkers. Okay, they build them for golf. Because it's fun and it's frustrating. But you have those moments that are amazing, right? So think about it, what I did with that motion. As this is coming down, there's elements of up. And that's really what can, that's why you see the odd teenage girl out here that you don't want to hit golf balls beside. Because she's hitting it way farther than you, Mr. Man. Right? Because she knows where the weight of the golf club is. She recruits things nicely to smash it. What do most folks do? They don't recruit things nicely to smash it. They, yeah, they overdo parts. When they overdo parts, they destroy the sequence of it. Right? That's why you ever say, I just, I'm just going to swing easy on this one. You didn't swing easy. You swung appropriately within your physiology in the correct sequence. The ball thought you swung hard because your whatever hard was, it's like, this guy can't hit it. And then that easy was, I was like, whoa, I felt that. Right? Because this is what, this is the business end, guys. This thing has to get moving. Okay? Now, again, I could talk about this stuff all day, but what time we got, buddy? Five. Okay, cool. So I'll go with a question, then I got to go back to my group there because we're doing short game, and then I got to jump in on some full swing stuff. But guys, there that ball, like those divots I took, and you know, I hit another shot. So one, as I kind of settle in, waggle, feel the weight of the club, collect the golf ball with my swing. Okay, this may be a good one, may not. Hopefully, it's a good one. We'll see. Okay, that was a little skinny too. So I didn't really give you an example of what I was trying to say there. And this is back to Jason Day. Jason Day is an honorary member at a club called The Vintage in Indian Wells, California. It's like the playground of billionaires, okay? I did a golf school there once, it was nuts. Bill Gates was having breakfast with Warren Buffett. Jason Day hit 20 drivers on track, man. How, so it, he swings at 117 miles an hour. All the golf balls flew 295. What do you think his dispersion was out there? What do you think? How about 75 yards? Wow. See, it's not very good right there. My moment of reflection is I gotta stop talking. What's that? You hit two fan, what are you gonna do next to hit it? Right. Yeah, so I hit two things, nothing. Okay. Right? I'm gonna do nothing different. I'm gonna maybe stop talking and maybe go through my routine a little bit more cleanly, right? Is my swing broken? Do I need to take a lesson? Because I know I don't. I know I kind of get the club in functional places. And you all have great little technology in your pocket. It's called a smartphone. The phone on your smartphone, guys, I paid thousands and thousands of dollars for equal recording equipment five years ago, okay? So let's see if I hit a solid shot right now under the gun, right? Okay, a little better, right? So what do you notice there? Big old divot? No. I'm really not even trying to take divots, guys. The bottom of my swing touches the ball, right? The bottom of my swing is deflected. When you hit something stationary with an angle, guess what happens? There's a, there's a violent reaction there. One thing gets forced one way, one thing gets forced another way. I'm not trying to mash the earth. If the bottom of my swing is, if the radius is traveling nicely, it collects the ball, right? The reaction is one thing will go up, the ball loses, because it's, it's way less weight than this thing, isn't it? One goes up, one goes down. And what you get as a result is really thin little divots, not pork chops. Mo Norman said, what's... Same for wedges too? Well, so think about it. With the wedge, it's a little different in that, you know, the approach on a seven iron is 60 some odd degrees, give or take. Right. With a pitching wedge, it's 63. You know, and it may tend to be a hair deeper. And traditionally, where do you play the golf ball with the wedge? Maybe even a bit more back. 
You know, so you may see, there's my sand wedge divot. You measure those, they're a little different, aren't they? Right? And with a three wood, am I going to take a divot? Probably not. With a driver, I certainly hope not. <laughs> right? And so how about this two with a driver, guys? What's our job with a driver? Is our, is our job to do this? No, should we ever hit the ground with a driver? Never. But I see more practice swings. What's that? How about this? Right? Why do, why do I see practice swings where people do this with a driver? Hit the ground. Doesn't make any sense. Question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions, guys? Anything about... You do, but you got a tea time. Well, ask me and I'll tell the rest of them. You know? Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. You bet. You bet. Take care. All the best. Thanks. Any questions, you guys, before I wrap up? Yeah. So you knocked it in from 108 yards, the next hole, different guy, right? So let me, let me say this to you. I take piano lessons with my kids on Monday nights. Okay? I do it because I figure if I do it, they've got to do it. I want them to learn how to play piano. My buddies, I grew up with that. I played sax as a kid. I enjoyed music. I enjoyed its math. There's coordination. There's the, you know, what's coming. Can you respond to the music? Right? So how about this? This is, this is me doing what you do as it relates to music. I play really simple like 80s rock songs like written for three-year-olds, okay? You, and you'll know the songs. But they're, they're written so easy that you, with basic piano skills that are still kind of hard, like shooting 85 on a golf course. That's pretty good, right? I can fumble through and play like Tom Petty, Free Fallen, Piano Man, stuff like that, okay? Piano Man's actually a big conquer. Still, still mess it up. I can sit there and I can play it one day. The next day, what happens? I, my fingers fumble over one another. I, I, the riff that I did yesterday just fine, I get stuck on the next day. What's that tell you? There's, uh, there's wide variability. Okay, how about this little bit of wind right now? Do you think that plays with balance a hair? You're darn right it does. How about this, guys? What do you practice on? You practice on something flat. How flat is a golf course? Don't be knuckleheads. And this is, again, link back to what I said. Where are, all, where are all these practice swings? They're up here. You can put a ball knee high for me, I'll hit it fine. Put a ball toward the grass, I'll hit it okay. You know what I mean, I hit a few thin ones there. And honestly, I don't usually hit two thin ones in a row, but I'm not gonna go take a lesson to fix it. Okay, not that I'm trying to discourage lesson taking because it's my livelihood, but the point is, I wanna show people a theme of improvement. You know, I always tell people the best thing about the golf school is this. We show you a routine to hit a shot with no guarantees you'll be successful. And you're like, what? Yeah, no guarantees, zero. Don't promise you're gonna get better. I promise is this, I care deeply about your golf game. I'm gonna try as hard as I can with my staff to help you understand it. I'm gonna give you with a training platform, which is online, where all your videos chronologically go into that space. Gary probably has one through because he works with Coach Aaron, who's exceptional, by the way. My assistants are amazing. So, and then from there, right, the continuity of it. So after we come mess with you and we change your personal familiars, sometimes people are a basket case because whatever they're familiar with is no longer familiar, then what? You're sort of lost for a while. But we explain and put in place a plan. Now it's up to you to use it. And then we give you a continuity program to stay in touch with us, which is basically if you know how to use your smartphone, you stay in touch with us because it's kind of a controlled environment where you can post videos and guess who sees them? I do and my coaches do and we respond to them. And then maybe I turn the camera back on and go, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, Ken, you got to get a little off here. Let's fix this. And you stay as a part of the team and part of the plan. I'm most proud of, and this you can look at a couple ways. I've had a lady come to my school six times. I've had many guys come four and five times. Okay, this week I have one returner. Every week now I'm having more and more returners. Either means they suck or they're having a lot of fun, right? It's got to be fun first. It's not work, it's fun. And maybe they're having fun and getting a little better and maybe want to scratch the surface and get a little better right so what do you need you need a mild plan you need a bit of a routine you need to understand there's three kinds of shots good bad and different your dog's still gonna like you when you get home do you have the skills to deal with the indifferent and the bad shots right can you reflect for a second 
right? What could you have done better? In some cases, nothing. Hey, it felt, eh, hit it thin, move on. I didn't need to change my swing. You know, performing and hitting in front of people and talking, that's a bit of a, a, a talent as well, right? Some guys are great at it. I'm decent at it, I'm not great at it. I don't do it that often, okay? So what I'll leave you with, guys, is, and I'll post this on YouTube. Go to, go to look up Martin Chuck or Tour Strigger on YouTube and you'll see this in a day or so. But if it worked, I'm assuming it recorded no problem. I, it sounds okay. But, you know, look at golf as well, every shot, you know, has got a beginning and an end, right? Can you take a club and put it in the starting form? Can you swing it to a finishing form? Can you reflect for a second? You know, did you have a blackout in there? Did you know, because most people do. Most people don't have any idea where the club is. It's like, nervous, gone, where to go, right? They don't really know where they swung the thing. So can you be engaged with yourself? Okay, so golf, and a lot of, that's what's kind of fun is the, is the journey of the game. You know, a little Band-Aid lesson I'm not a fan of because to me it's way more, people always say, Martin, should I take a lesson or go to the school? I say, go to the school because I got you for three days. You get to sleep on it two nights. First day, we'll change, we'll, we're going to move into your kitchen and we're going to relocate all the pots and pans and you won't know where anything is. Okay, second day, you'll be able to find the pots. Okay, sec third day, maybe you'll find where we put that funky spoon you need to get the cantaloupe out. All right, so that's what it's about, guys. And I'm not trying to sell you a golf school. Frankly, if you come, great. If you don't, you don't. You know, good news is we're busy. Okay, so I'm glad you came to see me. I hope you had some fun listening to my spiel. Right, it'll be on YouTube. Kev, thanks for the invitation. I got to go teach golfers, and I'm looking forward to getting back to work. So thanks for coming out, you guys. Thanks, thanks guys, for coming out.